Uh, skipping lunch, right? Nobody really wanted lunch today, right? Okay, great. Yeah, that's right, that's right. So, uh, how many of you here uh, saw Pat and I talk, do this talk at DerbyCon? Raise your hand. I want to see how many people are going to be taking a nap. Okay, all right. No, uh, th there is a little different uh, content here. It, it's only, it's been two weeks. <laughs> and things do happen in two weeks, I guess. But, uh, so anyway, this talk is about social engineering. It's called Hook, Line, and Sinker. It's, the focus of this talk is really uh, the tools and technology in social engineering, all right? We are all vulnerable to social engineering. So uh, this is not a talk to make fun of people who are vulnerable to social engineering because we all are. I am born, I'm a married man, so the biggest social engineering coup in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. If anyone has bought a car, right? The salesman's favorite color was not your favorite color. I'm sorry, ladies, I, I know he lied, sorry. Um, but anyway, so we are all vulnerable. We have to realize that and understand that. Um, but that's number one. Number two is you don't have to be a salesman or a woman to do social engineering, right? <laughs> Even guys who feel uncomfortable interacting with other carbon-based life forms can do social engineering, right? Um, especially if you have the help of technology, right? Especially gadgets, right? Dang, that's what I did. Okay. Sorry. Okay, bummer. No sound system. I forgot all about it. Get on um, with it, man. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Get on with it. Okay. Um, that was actually the request of my wife to put in a little video about get on with it because she knows I ramble. Um, so. The agenda for the talk today is uh, we're going to talk about reconnaissance a little bit, internet, um, some internet tools, uh, some telephone, just touch very briefly on that, and then get into exploitation where we're going to talk about, uh, Pat's going to kind of let you in on a, a new tool concept that we've been working on and um, collaborating with some folks with uh, on owning tool, on owning uh, IVRs and phone-based systems. Uh, and then... Uh, this, this one's a little different from the DerbyCon. Um, I've kind of spelled out my physical social engineering kit. We're going to talk about that a little bit. I have a little show and tell for that. Um, and as long as we don't totally run out of time, we'll get into uh, some demonstrations on some removable media attacks, uh, some tools, uh, and then some other uh, random stuff. And then, of course, we'll uh, repeat the following shameless plug. Boundstone is hiring. We don't necessarily want your money, we want your time. Your we blood, have, your sweat, your tears. We have cookies. Yes, we do have we do have cookies, although they are dark cookies. Um, and somewhat persistent. But uh, <laughs> dang man, sorry. I haven't had anything to drink today. It's weird. So uh, and then also I wanted to plug the Foundstone Twitter feed. Uh, there are several Foundstone Twitter feeds. There's the, uh, gosh, I'm drawing a blank on the book, Hacking Exposed feed. There's the uh, at FSEMEA feed, which is the UK Foundstone. There's the, the at Open Foundstone feed. And then there's the coolest one, the at Foundstone, right? That's the one that Pat and I contribute to, and Brad and Tom, it's kind of runs, and all the guys here in the United States. Um, so if you're out on Twitter, follow at Foundstone, and Brad will give me a persistent cookie. You know, the EMEA guys are going to haze us relentlessly. For yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they can do their own presentation. <laughs> right? No, actually, the FS EMEA guys are pretty old. Um, Carrick Dooley's over there uh, and, and all those guys. Um, but like I said, the at Foundstone one is really the coolest. Um, and I'm sure Brad will give me a non-sexual touch if I mention Fountain Feeds as well. So, okay, without further ado, um, some internet recon. Thank you for the laugh. I'll pass that on to my daughter. She gave me that image, um, the Ninja Kate, right? Um, essentially, when we do, when we get contracted to do a social engineering gig, and, and this goes for whether it's just a phishing, email phishing, phone-based, physical, whatever, whatever it might be, a, a, you know, removal media drop, um, we, we 
do a certain amount of reconnaissance. Now, sometimes the client will kind of give us some information to shortcut things, like, in other words, if they don't have the budget to pay us the time and effort involved in their con. Um, but most, in most cases, we do some amount of recon. Well, here is Internet Recon 101. Absolutely. And, and I know about uh, Paterva's Multigo, and I know about uh, FOCA. In fact, I have FOCA on this. FOCA's kind of cool. Um, I know about all those tools, but this is Internet Stalking 101. Four websites. Jigsaw, LinkedIn, Spokio, and Facebook. Right? This is, and I invite everyone to, to do this on yourself. Stalk yourself. Absolutely. And go back to your companies and tell them, show them how they can stalk themselves. Show them this video. Right? So, so let's see it in action. Right? So we start with Jigsaw. And of course, our, our um, so it's just Jigsaw.com. No special, you know, obfuscation there. Uh, our victim is going to be McAfee Incorporated. All right? Um, because that's, what my check says. I think our checks still say McAfee, don't they? I don't know. Yeah, I think they do. I've never seen my check stub. Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I have, and it says McAfee. Um, your check stub, that is. So we're going to look at McAfee. Um, notice that McAfee, there's a few McAfee's there, but we know that there are corporate offices in Santa Clara. So, so on Jigsaw, they have over 2,500 um, contacts listed for McAfee. Right, and so if you click on the Santa Clara, you get some basic information about the company. Um, but obviously, this is social engineering, so we're going to focus on the people. So we click on the directory of employees tab there, um, and so basically, Jigsaw is crowdsourced. So it's done by salespeople. Okay, these salespeople kind of uh, build this database, right? So we're going to sort alphabetically, and we're going to pick on a particular individual named Dave Ackley. Okay, that doesn't look good at all, but okay. Well, anyway, we'll see what happens. Um, here we go. Okay, so we clicked on Dave Ackley. Why did we do that? Dave Ackley's my boss, and he gave me permission. Okay, he's a nice guy. He's a good sport. So if you notice, um, under Dave Ackley, we see there Dave Ackley at safeboot.com. But we see a location of Naples, Florida, right? Not Santa Clara. So what's the deal? I thought McAfee was in Santa Clara, California. Well, obviously McAfee has offices all over the world. Apparently Dave maybe works at the Naples, Florida office, all right? So if we were to send him an email, we wouldn't say, how's the weather in Santa Clara, right? We'd say, how are things in Naples, right? But, but let's look again and focus on Dave and go, so we go to, um, to LinkedIn next, and we look for Dave, and we see Fort Myers, Florida. Okay, well, wait a minute. I put Santa Clara, Naples, Fort Myers. I'm getting a little confused. Where is this guy, right? Is he living in a mobile home down by the river or something? So, um, <laughs> he's mobile. Um, so anyway, so we open up his LinkedIn profile, and, and by the way, on LinkedIn, I'm not connected to him, and I was actually using an account on LinkedIn, so this is, there's no, you know, real connection here. So we open up his LinkedIn profile, and we notice SafeBoot. So we're thinking this is the same Dave Ackley, because believe it or not, there might be more than one out there somewhere. Um, and so, uh, so now we're trying to hone in on like personal information about him because we want to send him a phishing email, right? So we go out to Spokio, this is Spokio, and we search for Dave Ackley, and I apologize, this video is not like, it's kind of cutting a little bit, but, so we know he's in Florida. Um, we, we see that there is a Dave Ackley in Fort Myers. Actually, there's two Dave Ackleys in um, Fort Myers. Uh, you know, one in Largo, there's one in Naples, you know, so we're trying to hone down on, you know, where's the real Dave Ackley, the one that we're searching for, right? Um, so we go out to Facebook, right? Now we're, we're kind of getting to the personal side of Dave Ackley. So we do a quick search on Dave Ackley, and we look down, we look down, and lo and behold, here's a Dave Ackley who has McAfee in his profile, all right? Yes, he made it a little bit easy for us by being a proud employee of McAfee, right? He's drinking the red Kool-Aid. That's okay. Um, so, uh, and, and you can see like his little profile picture there, right, of a, on a motorcycle, right? So we go into his profile and we say, Estero, Florida. 
So that's more likely where he actually lives. He may work in the Naples office, but he probably lives in Estero, right? Um, and, you know, a few other things to kind of notice. He, he doesn't like uh, Facebook apps. Um, you know, he, we're kind of confirming here that, that he's a big motorcycle guy, motorcycle rider, because he likes um, Everglades motorcycle service, right? So, so you see, you know, already we're developing some, some of, we're finding out some of his interest, right? We could send him a little email about motorcycling in Florida, right? So, but let's look at um, Astero, Florida, because we're thinking that's probably him. So there's his address, right? Spokio is really cool. Um, there's another person in the household named Kimberly Ackley. Hmm, could be wife, could be daughter. Dave's 39 years old. Uh, he's a Taurus. <laughs> Coming from Ostero, Florida, Dave, that's right. Uh, his birthday is in May. He was born May of 1971 and a Taurus, right? We've narrowed it down to 30 days. No, we've narrowed it down to 18 days because of his, yeah, his zodiac sign. There's a picture of Dave's house, right? Okay, anybody starting to, yeah, okay. Your security, you have, you, you guys have tough stomachs, right? Um, let's see, he has one child who's between the age of zero and three years old. Yeah, somebody knows, somebody saw this at DerbyCon, they know where we're headed. Um, so we see Dave Ackley, we see, you know, D Ackley in the household, and Kimberly Ackley. All right, so let's go back to his Facebook page. He doesn't post his wall or photos, but notice right here, he posts his friends. He, he allows just anybody to see who his friends are, okay? And Dave's not a big Facebook user. He's only got 77 friends, right? You know, the average teenager today has like 500 or more friends. Um, in fact, I did a talk, and like half the ones I polled had over 1,000. So, but let's look at, some, at what some of his friends are posting. Okay, and here's where we, we cut to the chase. He's got a friend, Nancy Lincoln Benoit, who shares her wall, uh, has all kinds of information about herself, and if you do a search for the word Ackley, you notice that she commented on something that Dave's wife, Kim Earl Ackley, had posted a, a, an album called My Pride and Joy, all right? So one of their mutual friends, mutual Facebook friends, posted a comment with a link to it. Bada boom, bada bing, right? You click on that link and you go, and these are pictures of Dave's kids. And, you know, just different little uh, poses, some at the house, you know, some at the pool, different, uh, you know, here's little Halloween pictures, all kind of stuff, right? So y'all see that we're, we're starting to kind of gain some information that we could use in a phishing attack, right? We, we know, you know, we, we're getting the impression now that he's got actually two kids instead of just one. So maybe that stuff from uh, Spokio was a little out of date, right? Um, that happens all the time. That's one reason we use more than one website and, you know, kind of cross-reference stuff. Um, but one thing about one of these pictures, it said it was titled Tanner 2 Cali 1 in you know September 2010. So now we've got kids' names, right? What do you think Dave's passwords might be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, or at least his wife, right? Yeah, yeah, mommies do that. But really the cool thing is you get all these little comments that other people have posted about him. And so a lot of times, um, you know, there'll, there'll be little tidbits of information. But now, so whose fault is this? Is this his wife's fault for leaving her Facebook open? Not quite. Look at her Facebook page. She doesn't even share who her friends are. <laughs> yeah, her profile is more locked down than Dave's, right? So that's the thing. It's, it's and, and this is my rant on Facebook, my 10 second rant, fortunately, is when you have a Facebook account, you're leaving your security of your information in the hands of your friends. So, you know, pick your friends well, right? As they say, as they say, if you want to be rich in America, pick your parents well, right? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so that's just like Internet Stalking 101, quick hit, four websites, no big deal, right? Uh, kind of the next step is some other tools that are out there that, uh, uh, that are kind of scary. Um, anybody heard of Creepy? 
I know some of you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, good old Creaky, right? Is the person who wrote Creaky in the room? Okay, because I was going to say, I want to buy you a beer. But um, it's a little early, but hey. Uh, <laughs> creepy is really cool. Uh, you, uh, you have to have a Twitter account to use it. So you, know, you set one up. And then you put in a search for someone. And when they tweet, if they're using their phone to tweet, and it puts the geotag date on it, Creepy will uh, not only tell you where they were when they, when they sent that tweet, but what time it was. And, and you know all the tweets that it finds that have the geotagging data. So you can sort of like map their movements around based on their tweets. Um, yeah, pretty scary stuff. Uh, EXIF, is everybody familiar with what EXIF data is? XFRS? I don't know, I always mess up that acronym. But anyway, it's the geotagging data or the extra, the metadata it, that comes with a picture, right? So, uh, I bet everybody in here has a smartphone, right? Everybody. And most of us have either an iPhone or Android, right? If, you know, if, as one of our smartphones, right? And by default, geotagging data is being applied to every picture you take. You don't do that, right? Everybody here has turned that off, right? Because they didn't want, you know, when they sent somebody a picture for that data to be going along, right? No hands went up. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, my wife didn't know this. And I didn't know this, really, um, until very recently. So I, I did this little exercise where I grabbed all those pictures. And sure enough, it had all the you know, longitude and latitude. You just copy-paste into Google Maps, and you can just map out where you were. It's really kind of fun or scary. Um, all right, 10i is another... Uh, site where you can submit a picture and it will tell you where else that picture might be might have been posted on the internet so again it's a crowdsourced kind of database type thing but um but it's kind of handy if you come across a, a picture that you know you, you never know who might have, who else might have posted that picture somewhere or where the source came from um, of course peer-to-peer -peer sites are just full of just chock full of sensitive information, but uh, a little warning, you know, at a minimum use no script when you go to these peer-to-peer -peer sites, uh, or just use a non-persistent VM. That, that's kind of what I do, it's just easier. Um, some other sites out here, Ice Rocket, Tweets, those are, those are also kind of Twitter search sites. Uh, these next two... <laughs> it's like Silent Hill again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, these next two sites here, Glassdoor and Career Bliss, uh, basically these are sites that you go to bitch about your employer, right? Um, so yeah, people just complain, 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 and you can put, you can pick up a lot of good information about, especially when they're complaining about the IT environment, right? You know, I called the help desk and they were troubleshooting this specific problem in this specific application or business app. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a, a wealth of information. Um, FB Pwn is, a, is a, a very new kind of app that will actually go out and um, search for information on your friends on Facebook. And, you know, kind of, it kind of spiders their, um, their information. Um, and then I mentioned Maltigo. Everybody's kind of uh, pretty familiar with Maltigo. So, um, you know, everybody here has, is probably familiar with carnal ownage, right? Um, and you're familiar with ponage. And this morning, if you were kind of in the exercise room around 6 o'clock, you would have heard me and you'd be familiar with monage and groanage. <laughs> but I want to introduce you to phonage. Thanks, Chris. You like it better. <laughs> All right, so um, you know, so Chris talked a little bit about some uh, some some OSINT, um, you know, sort of attack vectors and some of the tools that are useful for uh, gathering data on people. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about uh, attacking telephone systems and you know specifically PBXs and IVRs. Um, so, um, how many folks in here have performed a, a telephone-based social engineering gig before? Okay, cool. So. Um, 
at the end of the day, would it have been useful to have a legitimate account number that you could dial into a voice loop and get an agent on the other end of the telephone line? I mean, that would lend credibility uh, to you know, your, your attack vector. They would think that you're you know, an actual customer of the organization. Um, would it have been helpful to have a voicemail account inside of the organization that you were hired to target? Um, at the end of the day, you could call the help desk and say, you know, I am, you know, ABC employee, uh, you know, can you just leave my voicemail, or excuse me, leave my password on my voicemail box? And so it lends credibility to your attack, right? So it, it sort of expands the number of attack vectors available to you and, and makes existing attack vectors more effective. Um, looking around, I haven't really seen an awful lot of tools out there that exist to attack uh, specifically um, I IVRs, right? Or uh, you know, inter interactive voice response systems. Um, or, or to really attack voicemail boxes and try to brute force voicemail passwords. So um, I was out at Black Hat and I saw that there was a talk uh, on the roster about attacking IVRs and it was actually stepped on by a PCI compliance talk, unfortunately. So I didn't get to see it and it, you know, it got me thinking, right? It said, you know, I said, you know, what can we do to maybe develop something in this area? So. Chris and I came up with the idea of this uh, multi-purpose phone pwn engine, right? We've, we've you know, nicknamed it phone Inch for now. Sort of a working uh, idea that's in process. It's in pre-alpha right now. We don't really have anything that's ready to, to kick out there, um, unfortunately. I'm hoping to have something in the next few months. But the idea behind this is I wanted to leverage existing, uh, existing things that are, that are out there, right? Like Warbox, um, you know, iWar, Telesweep, et cetera, uh, where I could. Definitely leverage VoIP, right? Because I don't like carrying around a, a bank of modems and VoIP is much more scalable and, and portable, et cetera. Um, and, and easy to use, right? I want something that's GUI based, that's sort of, you know, point and click phonage, you know, essentially, so that uh, you don't have to be a coder to use the tool. Um, my goals here were to uh, create a tool that could brute force voicemail boxes, revert for, revert, reverse brute force voicemail boxes. I haven't even been drinking today and I'm stuttering. Um, brute force IVR systems and um, and then also um, you know as an added bonus sort of uh, develop you know a, a, a vishing engine um, with an integrated IVR right something that I could have call a number of phones and say something right like this is your infosec group and we're doing a voicemail password survey please enter your extension please enter your voicemail password right so um, how many folks in here have seen Warbox uh, HD Morse tool it's a fantastic tool. I'll just run you guys through a quick demo. Um, HD Moore did a lot of good work in this area. Um, props out to him. He, you know, basically I'm just going to hopefully be um, adding to uh, his his existing tooling. So I'll show you uh, show you a little bit about Warbox. So Warbox, basically we start the engine. It's a Rails app. Listens on local port seven 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 seven, and then we point a browser to local host point. 4777 authenticate. And here's Warbox, right? So we have a job scheduling screen, a screen that shows a, you know, the results of jobs that we've run, the analysis of those jobs, the provider that we're using. This is a, a VoIP provider. In this case, I'm using Teleax. And then this is just a little bit about Warbox. Let's go ahead and schedule a job. Um, in this example, I'm calling myself. I blanked out my phone number there. Um, Florida is a two-party consent state, so I, I didn't want to just call around arbitrary numbers because this tool actually records uh, phone calls that come in. So I go ahead and, and schedule the job, and you can see the job is, uh, is going. It's, it's running now. And um, time passes. What, the, what this is doing in the background is calling the number, recording the first 53 seconds of audio, and then uh, dumping it out to a file. And you can see that the results got dumped out to a file. One of these telephones answered. And then what Warbox does is it actually does analysis of the audio that's recorded during that conversation. And it spits out what's kind of a footprint, right? So it spits out a waveform of what the call looks like. And what we can see is that there's, there's kind of a fingerprint here, right? So this is what that particular call looked like when we recorded and do the analysis. And um, that, that's really important. That's, a, that's kind of a key uh, piece of this tool that I'm, that I'm putting together. So, for some reason the video froze there. Okay, 
So anyways, thanks HD for an awesome tool. Um, basically, uh, what I want to do is expand upon this tool to allow me to interact with stuff. Right now, Warbox makes an outbound call, it records data, and then it does analysis of the data. So what I want to do is I want to call into a voicemail box, I want to wait for the voicemail box to pick up, right? Uh, punch whatever key combination is necessary in order to provide a password to the voicemail box, and then punch in a password and see what comes back. Most likely, let's say I have a four-character you know, four password, so it'll be somewhere between 0000 and 9999, right? I have 10,000 possible combinations. So 9,999 of those combinations are going to respond with, I'm sorry, but you've provided me with the wrong password. So if I record that failure message, that failure notification, and fingerprint it, I know what it looks like. Anything that doesn't look like that has to be a successful attempt at logging into a voicemail, right? So that's essentially what we want to do. Um, you know, we'll, we'll end up with something like this, right? Login failure, login failure, login failure. Attempt number four is not a login failure. I don't know what it is, but it's not a login failure. So if I'm recording, you know, the DTMF tones, or well, I, excuse me, I know what DTMF tones I sent at that particular voicemail box. I can go back, look at those, and then punch them in manually and see whether or not I'm in someone's voicemail. Um, you know, potential issues, this is easily mitigated via account lockout. If I only have three tries, then it doesn't really matter. Um, if, if I have excessive attempts coming in uh, at one extension from, you know, one number, maybe some type of a PBX firewall would prevent that. I, I don't know for sure if there's a product that does that, but uh, Warbox provides the ability to dynamically spoof calling party number, so that could easily be avoided. And then also speed. However, you know, Warbox uh, scales easily, right? So I can spawn 100 lines using this IAX2 account. I'm paying a penny per minute for my time. So it's going to cost me a dollar for every 100 attempts. You know, to make 10,000 attempts is not going to be prohibitively expensive. And if the entropy is only, you know, 10,000 guesses, there's no account lockout, then it's going to be relatively easy to get someone's password. You know, another thing we could do with this is we could use it to call across, say, 10,000 numbers. If I, can, uh, if I can enumerate the public telephone address space of a corporation, call 10,000 numbers and try a common password like 1111 or 2222, I can use the exact same, uh, the exact same approach, right? I know what a failure notification looks like. I'm just going to dial all these numbers and try one attempt at each number and you know, wait until I get a non-failure notification. Um, maybe there's controls at the phone switch, but you know, again, um, spoofing calling party number might be uh, might be uh, you know a quick way around that. And, and this is a little easier to implement, right? Um, the third idea that I want to integrate into this tool is um, an engine which will make outbound calls and then dump those called parties into a voice loop, right? Um, the target could be prompted for sensitive data, like, hey, this is your bank calling, please enter your account number, or please enter your credit card number and the expiration date. That data could then be recorded back into a database for later analysis. Really, you know, the, the, your imagination is your limit here. Um, people are doing this in the wild right now, um, but there isn't really any type of tooling that I've been able to find that makes it easy and brings it to the masses, which, you know, obviously we want to use our powers for good. The, the idea is really to just wait, raise awareness. Um, Etc. Um, and then, finally, you know what I want this thing to be able to do. This is the real meat and potatoes of of, of the idea here. Um, so, if I call my insurance company or my bank and I give them, you know, a five-digit account number or whatever it is that their voice loop prompts me for, chances are that IVR system is reaching into some backend database, someplace that contains sensitive account data, right? Maybe it contains my, uh, maybe it just contains my five-digit account number, but the end result is, is that it lets me do things like interact with my checking account or interact with my credit card details, et cetera, right? And uh, it also could potentially allow me to interact with an agent afterwards. That agent has all kinds of interesting information about me, like my home address, my phone numbers, my social security data, et cetera. So if I can brute force these five-digit account numbers, effectively, you know, I can pull information out of the databases that the IVRs and or the agents have access into by impersonating people dialing into the phone loop. So, um, so the idea is almost exactly the same as, uh, you know, as, as the, uh, the voicemail attacks, but um, you know, instead of responding to a prompt for a voicemail password, we're responding for an IVR prompt for account number, right? So maybe they want the last four of your social and your birth date or something like that. There, there's not a lot of entropy in any of these systems, right? So 
in a relatively small amount of time, we can get a lot of information back out of these IVR systems. And you know, that, that information could potentially be, be devastating, right? Um, at the bare minimum, it can really help us uh, you know, execute a successful social engineering attack. So, so that's my idea, and um, you know, I'm currently working on it. Again, it's pre-alpha. Um, I'm hoping to have something complete and out there in the next few months, but it's definitely something to think about, right? I mean, you know, today, these IVRs have so much reach within organizations, and I, I just don't feel like there's been an awful lot of thought given to the problem yet. So thanks, guys. I'll turn it back to Chris. Thanks, Pat. And, and by the way, um, we, we saw some activity out there uh, after DerbyCon, after the talk at DerbyCon, I don't remember the guy's name now, but um, had, you know, he had kind of gotten inspired by some of this and, and is doing some coding along these lines. So if, you, if you're into the whole phone ownage kind of stuff, um, you know, hook up with Pat, all right? Like he said, it's a community type thing, right? And you know, if you got stuff to bring to the table, great. Okay. So moving on, um, and this is the different stuff from DerbyCon, so the people who are at DerbyCon, you can wake up now. Um, <laughs> I guess, if you really want to. Um, so uh, in some conversations with, with JP and some other, other folks at DerbyCon, we, you know, we were kind of kicking around different ideas and things um, about social engineering. And, um, and, and one thing, I, I guess I'm kind of a gadget guy, right? Y'all see my clicker, and I, I mean, I just got all kind of crap spread up, you know, and, and you should see my office at home. It's just terrible. Um, you know, I've got, I, in fact, I have the first clamshell computer that I ever owned. It was a, a, a Hewlett Packard HP 200LX. Y'all remember those, right? It's kind of a gray, had a little keyboard and everything. Yeah, it was cool. Um, ran Lotus 123, I think. Uh, and, and I still have it at home, so I'm kind of a gadget guy. So, uh, you know, when I started getting into social engineering, you know, they, the, sort of, the two kind of go in hand in hand. Um, and so I looked around the house and, and realized, you know, I had a lot of junk that when I go and do physical social engineering, I take some subset of it. But it seems like, it's almost like the camping trip or, or the line that uh, Gandalf says in The Hobbit, take a road because you won't, so you won't need it, right? If you don't take a rope, you'll wish you had it, right? And it just seems like when I get in some remote town, I'm always thinking, damn, I should have brought that thing back at that, it would be perfect for this situation. So I finally came up with this idea, well, I'm just gonna create a kit, right? Am I making good enough references? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, I read The Hobbit when I was little. Okay, so, um, so anyway, so, so that's the concept of a kit. You know, what is a kit? It's just it's just going to be this collection of crap that, like, each engagement you'll use 10% of it, but the problem is you never know what 10% you're going to use, so you have to take it all, right? And usually it'll be a different 10% because you just never know. Um, I was on an engagement earlier this week in South Florida, right? Sunny South Florida. Took my sunglasses. Does anybody know what the weather was like in South Florida? Yeah, it was like a monsoon here all freaking week. Yeah, yeah. So I had to get creative, right? Fortunately, I took an umbrella. But um, so, um, so, so that's what a kit is, and that's kind of why you need a kit. Um, the characteristics of a good kit are, it, it really comes down to kind of being modular and, and you know, size matters. Right, it's all you know. The the small in this case, the smaller the better, right? Because a lot of times, like if anybody's noticed my my back brace, right? Um, and and I truly did have some back surgery recently. I promise. Um, and I had a gig, like while I was still required to wear the back brace. Well, I have so much crap that I want to take with me into a building to exploit whatever, um, it's very difficult, you know, I can't carry a backpack and have a back brace, right? That kind of breaks the whole scenario of I have a back brace on, right? So, um, so one of my big concerns was I can only take stuff that will fit in my pocket now, right? And of course these pants are baggy so that helps, but still, right? Um, the biggest problem I had, and I want to point out one tool in specific for this example, is the pump plug, 
all right? These things are really cool, and I'll tell you a little more about the pump plug uh, later, but um, my only disadvantage to it was when if I put it in my pocket, it's a little thick. It doesn't quite look like a cell phone, right? It looks kind of creepy. <laughs> so, um, you know, so fortunately, these particular jeans I have on are kind of like the boot cut or whatever flare, so I was able to stuff it, stuff it in a sock, um, which kind of fit the thing because it kind of hurt my ankle and I was kind of limping a little bit. So, so not only was I walking in like it was a back brace, I was also limping, you know. Um, my daughter thought that was hilarious, but um, okay. So uh, some future development ideas. Um, you know, JP and I were talking until late last night about doing like the ultimate, uh, I think Pwn Drive is kind of the, the working name of it. That combines like a teensy type functionality with a, a terabyte size USB drive so you can have all your rainbow tables you know not just the the, the crappy little landman whatever's but your NTLM's and your MD5's and all that stuff um, and just kind of make it like the ultimate you plug it into the computer and you load a bunch of scripts and it just owns it like nine ways and just says, you know, would you know, would you like me to make you a sandwich too while I'm at it? You know, that kind of stuff. So those are some of the the, the dream Greenfield dream ideas. So um, so I have a kit, and it took me I don't know two and a half years to kind of assemble this kit. It's just been kind of getting stuff as I need it. Um, but you know, when you start going out there looking, like if you were to just say, okay, I want to make a kit, how would I do that? Where would I go to get a kit? Well, you know, um, there's all kind of uh, soldering kits out there that you can make your own gadgets for this stuff. Um, you, you can go out to PRJC for the for the Teensy device. Um, you go to IronGeek.com for all the for for the great code to put on the Teensy, right? Um, and and you know how to how to assemble the dip switch onto the the nice long Teensy board and you know all that stuff and um, you, know, you go out to Mauser for some more electronics. You go out to hackfromak.com for your katana multi boot, right? Um, for some, some good ownage. You go out to Pio, whatever, how you, how you pronounce that, for con boot, another tool. So, you know, all these different places, right? Or you can go out to Ace Hackware. All right, y'all like that name? Ace Hackware? Yeah. The, the helpful hacker place. Um, so anyway, a friend of mine uh, named Taylor Banks, uh, if y'all recognize the handle Dr. Chaos, maybe, um, of old Anon OS fame. <laughs> I said, it just doesn't sound right. Okay. Anyway, um, you go out to Ace Hackware. Uh, he, he is, and, and his site is kind of beta right now, all right? Some of the, some of the stuff he's got there is actual, you know, particular things that you can get. Uh, but he's also assembling like these kits of you know if you if you don't want to mess with having to pick out each individual item he's got like a suggested package of here's kind of the base package here's the disguise package here's the whatever right so it's all kind of little little hacker um, social engineering stuff and as I find more stuff oh hey there's this new cool little thing I shoot it over to him he, he sources it, finds like the best place to get it at the cheapest price, and then puts it on his site. So it's kind of cool that way. Yep. All right, so I'm told we've got about five minutes. Um, so very quickly, I want to show you uh, a few cool things from my kit. Obviously, I can't show you everything. Um, but uh, yeah, let me show you a couple things here. Let's see. Uh, OK. Um, Anyone familiar with Proxmark 3? Yeah, like proximity, cloning proximity cards, all right? Um, this is the kit that you get. It's like three or 400 bucks. It's a little expensive. You can get cheaper ones, um, but you sort of have to build your own. So this, this is, you know, this is kind of for if you don't have time or talent to build your own like me, um, or a shop or whatever. Um, one interesting thing is the is the implementation of these of these devices. You have to keep that in mind, okay? The the and the key is when you go to clone a card, you need this antenna to bump up against someone's waist, 
basically. That's kind of the scenario. So you either run this down the sleeve of a jacket, right? And then, and then you know, bump them while you're standing in line at the subway or something like that, or in the subway station. Or you can put it in your back pocket and back into them. That's another clever one. Um, but if you don't, if you don't want to wear a long sleeve shirt or a jacket because it's 110 degrees, right? You can get a USB drive case that has a little pocket on the outside, and you put the antenna there, and then you just carry this thing around. And it's amazing how people don't notice, you know, black on black kind of thing. In fact, um, if someone is holding their their badge in their hand, sometimes they'll bump against you, right? Um, so things like that. Um, this is a little button camera. I highly recommend uh, if you're doing physical social engineering testing, you should film as much as you possibly can. The clients love it. They can show it to the CEO. This particular button cam, um, you put it in a black jacket in like a little breast pocket and this week, I walked around a building and no one ever said a word about my camera. It's amazing, right? It's amazing what people don't see when they're not looking for it. Um, and against the black shirt, it works as well. Did it that way where I just kind of put it in the button that way, kind of behind there. Um, I mentioned Pwn Drive. The, the form factor for Pwn Drive, I found this little drive at, at Best Buy that is about the size of a cell phone. Right, so I can slip this in a pocket, right, and, and not look totally creepy. Um, one other thing that the last thing I just wanted to mention real quick, because I thought it was uh, kind of a unique idea, and I got the idea at one of the talks at DEF CON, and I think there was a talk about this at DerbyCon as well, when they started talking about owning uh, the network through the power lines, <coughs> right? These things are pretty cheap. This is just a little, it's just a little Ethernet switch that you plug into your computer and plug into the power lines, and if there's another such device plugged into the power lines, then you are now networked with that computer, right? Um, I noticed that DISH Network, I have DISH Network satellite at home, and those devices have that technology built in. They have that little switch built in. So, you know, you, you just never know what you're gonna find, right? So. Um, Another required piece of equipment is some type of pocket access point because usually you, you don't have enough room to carry a laptop or even a netbook and so a little tablet will, will obviously do the job or just your cell phone that's got Wi-Fi on it so when you get you know, on the network and you kind of go through and do your dastardly deeds. All right, so I think that's about all the time we've got. Yeah, so I'm going to... Um, skip those demos and everything and go straight to the shameless plugs of Foundstone is hiring. So Pat and I will be around. Pat's up here all weekend. I'm here kind of pretty much the rest of the day. Um, and check out at Foundstone on Twitter. All right. Thanks for your time. Appreciate it.